I was able to just take some alone time. Like it was just me and God for a couple of months. I had a little closet under the stairs that we called the Harry Potter room. I love that. <laughs> and and it became my little sanctuary. I had my scriptures in there. I went in there several times a day to pray and to read and to really communicate with God. And I was just like, what do I do with these feelings of not being worth anything? Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. My guest today grew up all over the world as the daughter of a United States Air Force pilot. As a result, she has a severe case of wanderlust and frequently dreams of living abroad again. Until her dream is realized, she lives in Utah where she spends most of her time raising her five children. Her novels, Edenbrook and Blackmore, have been translated into 15 different languages and have won numerous awards. I am pleased to present Julianne Donaldson. Julianne, are you ready to share your story of hope? I am, Tamara. Thanks so much for having me with you. It's... Oh, this is going to be so fun. So I have to ask the question, since you grew up all over the world, what was one of the favorite places that you lived? Definitely Germany. I don't think you can get a better abroad experience than living in Germany. So we were there from 86 to 89. I was a teenager. Um, we got to see so much of Europe and ex got to experience so many different cultures. I even was able to visit Berlin before the wall came down. Wow. And it was just life changing. It really opened my eyes to a much bigger world outside of my own culture and um, just really gave me, a, like I said, like a severe case of wanderlust. <laughs> always, always, always wanting to travel and see new places. Okay. So what is on your bucket list to have places to visit still? There's a lot. So I have, <laughs> I mean, we could talk, we could talk all day about the bucket list. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So like, I've never been to Italy. Um, I've never even actually been to Hawaii. I haven't been anywhere tropical for some reason, all of my, well, that that's wrong. I've been, I lived in the Philippines, so that's very hot, but most of my travels have been in the Northern hemisphere, but my, for my bucket list, I love to have things to do in places. So, mm. for example, I want to see the Northern Lights in Iceland. Ooh, and yes. I want to, there's this um, biking trail in England, like Northern England, and it goes from the Irish Sea to the Channel. And it goes from like Manchester all the way over to like Robin Hood's Bay. And you can get on this biking trail and bike all across the peaks and the dales and the moors. And there's little inns that you stop at along the way to stay overnight. And that's been a big dream. In fact, I have a little, a little indoor bike that I ride regularly to train for my my bike trip across England someday. <laughs> oh my word, girl. Okay. You're going to have to tell me when you do that trip. <laughs> I might want to sneak into your suitcase or something. <laughs> I've been to England once and I absolutely loved it. I think one of the, my favorite things was my mother-in-law. We went with my in-laws and my mother-in-law wanted to go see the thatched roof cottages yeah. And it was so amazing. I'm like, people still have thatch roof cottages in England. They do like they do entire towns of them. And it just blew my mind. I'm like, wow. So it was kind of fun. It's, it's so cool. Anyway, give you more stuff for future books, right? <laughs> yes, I know I'm always getting, I, well, and that's the perfect excuse to travel too. I can just say, I'm going to write a book about this. I've got, it's a business expense. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my goodness. That sounds so fun. Yeah. Oh, so 
even though you can't travel all the time, you've got to deal with real life. And we're going to dive into a little bit of your real life today. Okay. So let's go back a couple of years to when life started to perhaps go from looking halfway normal to unraveling a little bit. So tell us what normal looked like and how it started to unravel for you. Okay, so 2015, I think, was the last time life felt normal. Wow. Um, it's been a while. So, so normal was, you know, I had a husband who was an attorney and an active member of our church, our congregation, and in fact, had a leadership position in our congregation. And I had uh, five kids. I had four kids that I had planned, and then I had a surprise caboose six oh. years after the fourth. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and you know, we just, we were doing the busy, happy, young family thing, you know, and I was working on my career as an author and, and supporting my husband and his career and things took a turn. And, you know, it's, it's strange when things take a turn and you think like, oh, okay, we've established a family and, and, you know, we're on this path that I want us to be on, you know, and, and things changed. And by the end of 2016, I was looking for a divorce, divorce attorney and um, things got so bad <laughs> that, you know, I had to confront this idea that I had never confronted before. Cause I had this real, like, black and white thinking about marriage and divorce, you know, and it was, you don't put your kids through a divorce. You do everything you can to keep your kids from divorce. And I really had to face um, the question of what is everything I can, you know, at what point is um, staying worse for them than leaving. And once I hit that point and my friend, I had a good friend who really helped me see it. I called her and I, She's known me and, and has known, had known my ex for 10 years. And I called her and I said, you know, I feel like I should not live anymore. You know, I feel like everyone would be better off without me. And mm -hmm. she said, you know, there's, she says, you know, what's keeping you there? You know, that you're so unhappy that you feel like you, you should kill yourself. What's, what's keeping you there? And I said, I just can't, I've just been so committed to never putting my kids through the experience of a divorce. And she said, well, you know what? I think kids can get through a divorce, but I don't think they ever get over a parent killing themselves. Mm -hmm. So if that's really what you're considering, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Do the other one, you know? And it was like, you know, it's like in terms of giving my all, I'd given my all to the point where I I was no longer um, worth saving, you know, and I'm and I had to come to terms with this idea that like no one no one asked me to put myself on an altar. God didn't. Um, the world didn't. The expectations of marriage even doesn't ask me to lay myself on an altar and be willing to even you know, give up my life for, for the sake of this marriage that was so um, wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, it, it's, it's hard to realize that sometimes we feel so broken that we hit that, I don't know what else, what else to call it besides rock bottom, you know, where you just feel, I can't possibly sink any lower than I am right now. Right. You know, it's almost like you want to give up on yourself, like you were just describing there. Um, what what was your conversation with God like at that lowest point of your life? Well, I actually had some. A couple of really sweet personal spiritual experiences at that time. So so. I guess I should give you a little, a little background. Like at that point, um, my husband was completely consumed with his own career and my kids, you know, like 
all the different ages and even having a baby and all that went into raising them on my own. And then I also had so much pressure to help provide for the family um, with my writing. Mm. And we, we had bought a new house and overextended ourselves and didn't think about taxes that I needed to pay on my, on my writing royalties. Oh. And, and everything felt like it was resting on me. Like the fate of the family, um, you know, my children, raising my children, providing for my children and supporting my husband were all just the heaviest weight on my shoulders. And I felt, I felt like, um, you know, like I was really sinking beneath this weight. And I had one morning when I woke up early and just laid in bed and I was just talking to God. I was like, you know, like what, how am I going to get out of this awful situation that I'm in right now with all this debt and all this um, really unhealthy relationship going on in my marriage and, and everything else, like all the pressures of my career, how am I going to get out of this? And I had this thought come to me and, and it was, I will reveal the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future. And, and it was slightly different from the scripture, you know, so it's Jeremiah 29, 11. So the scripture is for, I know the plans I have for you. And what was given to me in that moment was I will reveal the plans I have for you. And that was just, it, it was like, it was like a gift, you know, how it just came into my mind. Um, and I just went and I printed it up on a, you know, on a little poster that I got framed and I hung it in my house and I just kept reading it every day. I'd walk by and read it 10 or 20 times. And, and I didn't know what that plan was. You know, he mm -hmm. said I would reveal it, but like, it didn't look like he was revealing it because things were just getting worse and worse and worse at home. And so I had another experience where I was just praying to God and saying, you know, I, I feel like, I felt like a, this is language I came up with on my own, but I felt like I was a throwaway soul. I felt like I had, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> I was a placeholder, like um, a generational placeholder where I was making the connection between my parents and my children, you know, between these two generations. And I didn't have any worth myself. I was just there to keep my kids happy and to keep my husband happy. And it didn't matter if I was happy. Mm. And some of that was um, due to like, cultural ideas about a woman's place and a woman's responsibility mm -hmm. and some of it was just messages that I was being given in in my marriage mm. can I just ask you a question about yes. that because I think that is something that we as women and I know it's not just women's and I know a lot of men struggle with that as well those feelings of complete it's like a complete lack of self-worth that I have value. And sometimes it is people throwing that message at us, but how do you recover from something like that? How do you build up self-worth when you feel you are worthless? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask it this way. How did you do it? Uh, well, the first thing I did was I found a really good therapist. Mm. who helped me sort through the lies and helped me find some truth for myself and um, really helped me get some clarity on what I was dealing with. Um, <clears throat> so that was the first thing that was really helpful. And then the second thing that was really helpful was, you know, once, once she kind of took away the power of the lies that I had been told, then I, I was able to just take some alone time. Like it was just me and God for 
a couple of months. I I had a little closet under the stairs that we called the Harry Potter room. I love that. <laughs> and and it became my little sanctuary. Um, I had my scriptures in there. I went in there several times a day to pray and to read and to really communicate with God. And I was just like, just trying to know, like, like, what do I do with these feelings of not being worth anything? And um, I actually read this scripture. You know, he's talking to Jerusalem, you know, but he says, stand up get, you know, out of the dirt and take off the chains around your neck and stand up, oh, daughter of Zion, you know, stand up. So, and I just felt like he was telling me like, you don't belong where you've been put, you know, or where you think you have to be. Like you don't belong down in the dirt, <laughs> feeling terrible about yourself. Take, take those chains off. Everything that's binding you down and making you feel like you're worthless, take them off and stand up and, and claim your place, you know, claim your place as a daughter or, you know, as a child of God. Um, having that, you know, just those two months of that intense personal communication with God helped me so much. I really started to come back to a sense of who I was and who I always was, you know, like my real eternal nature and also felt his love, you know, that he didn't, he wasn't asking me to stay and keep putting myself on an altar <laughs> to be, you know, sacrificed for the sake of the family. Like he actually really loved me. He loved you for you. Yeah. That is, that is beautiful and powerful. Now, what, what statements did you begin telling yourself as part of this um, therapy, I guess you would say, that, that helped remind you of yourself? Or did you, did you make a list or did you just say a new one to yourself whenever you thought of it? Or what did that, what did that look like? I'm, I'm curious because I know that, that I've had to remind myself of things like with power statements or uh, mission statements or stuff like that, um, that I say frequently, is that what it looked like for you? Or did, did you, what did you do? Well, I definitely had, you know, I, I had work that I was doing with my therapist. I had, I did have like a list of who I really am. And, and that, and that's so it's surprising how difficult that was to know because I had been, you know, I'd been lied to and I had been manipulated. And so I was like, okay, I have to come back to my true self. And so I made true self kind of my, my go-to phrase, you know, like, like who am I really inside? And then, and then um, I also started picturing myself because I think that I felt like my true self wasn't someone worth loving, but then I started picturing myself as like a five-year-old version of me, um, you know, like, and I would just talk to that five-year-old version of myself. And I would even call myself by name, you know, when I was imagining that little five-year-old girl, oh, Julie, you try so hard today. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but but it, you got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So did you then make a list of your true self characteristics yeah. or worth or value? Yeah. I did. Yeah. I made a list. And How I was long was it? It was long. I was surprised by how long it was. Oh my goodness. It just, yeah. Can you give me an example of a couple of the things that you, you reminded yourself of? I'm joyous. I like to spontaneously dance. I like to like make up songs and sing them to my kids. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> did that in the car the other day uh, about last 
about a month ago on a family trip and my I thought my daughter was gonna die <laughs> she's like mom what is this crazy song you're making up I'm like join in she's like looking at me like mm, I don't know mom <laughs> Oh, it's funny. That is awesome. I love that you made this list. I love that you said it to yourself. And here's the question. Did it work? Yes, it did. It worked. And I was able to come back to a sense of who I was. And I was able to come back to a sense of being worthwhile and worth love. And, you know, it was hard. It was hard work. It was, it was unpacking a lot of, of pain to go kind of to go down that road and, you know, think about why I had lost myself. And um, there was a lot of healing that had to happen along the way, but I did feel really, um, I felt like people came into my life at the time they needed to come. I mean, that therapist was a gift. She gave me the tools that I needed to really see what was going on and to feel capable of changing. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing was, you know, if, if it had been possible to save my marriage, I would have, you know, but she helped me to see that like, oh, you've tried, you know, it's been 17 years that you've uh -huh. been trying this and, you know, like, like there are some things that don't change in life. There are some, some, some things that like, it doesn't matter how hard you try, it doesn't change. And when that, and when I finally was able to accept that, then I felt God saying, I'm going to deliver you now. You've been in captivity and now I'm going to deliver you. And it was the scariest thing to consider leaving. I mean, just terrifying for me. But not only did I feel like he would deliver me, I felt like he wanted to deliver me. And when I, you know, went back and, and asked, you know, maybe, maybe in a few years, could I put this off for a few years? I have a two year old, you know, maybe, maybe once he's in school, and I can actually work to support myself and my kids, you know, and I was given this, um, you know, this really strong spiritual impression about what would happen if I waited. And, and I said, okay, never mind. I won't, I won't wait. <laughs> I'll, I'll go now. And so, but I really did feel like he was, you know, he was parting the Red Seas for me. And he was like saying, come on, it's time. Wow. So it probably gave you such an appreciation for that story in the Old Testament of Moses and the children of Israel leaving and just the apprehension. I think it's it's interesting that we can look at stories like that and say, well, why didn't they X, Y, and Z? It just seems like so logical in our brains. But when we put ourselves in their situation and we're asked to do something new and different that takes us through uncharted waters and maybe through a desert for a little bit, yeah. you know, we're probably just as whiny and complainy as they were. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> the whole time we're saying, are you sure you're leading us the right way? <laughs> are you sure I have to go this way? Oh my goodness. Way. Yes, absolutely. I, I remember feeling that exact same way many years ago. <laughs> like, I don't want to go that way. Too bad. You can't go back because the army of Pharaoh's there. Gosh, dang it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you want to die or do you want to go through the Red Sea? Red Sea is good. <laughs> I will go forward, even though I'm scared to death to do it. Um, did you find, because taking those steps towards a new different is so, it's scary. There's no other word for it. It's scary. So how did you find the strength to take those steps forward through your own personal Red Sea? Well, I definitely, you know, it was definitely a me and God experience. I didn't feel like I had a person on the earth who was like going to stand by my side and really help me through it. It was like me and God together. We're like, we're in this, you know, and, and every day was scary 
you know, and there were times when I tried to say, oh yeah, oh, actually, you know, maybe my old life was okay. And I could just, you know, go back, you know, and then I get pushed and shown, shown a new reason why I can't go back and then pushed uh -huh. and pushed. And, and I think that for me, I mean, everybody is different in terms of, um, how they feel about divorce and, and what they're willing to contemplate for me, because it was an absolute never, I had a really hard time accepting that that was what God wanted me to do. And so I really relied on some very powerful revelations that God gave me, you know, through prayer and through scriptures and through dreams I had, you know, he was, he was delivering what I needed. And I needed like, you know, like the burning bush, like I needed the big vision, the, the big deal, because I wouldn't have gone for anything less. Mm, wow. So let me ask you, what was it that pulled you forward when you were so scared? What was it that you kind of focused on and said, okay, I'm moving forward because here's what I'm looking forward to. Or here's what I'm hoping for. Um, I had, I had this really strong impression or a vision um, that came as I was pleading to not go through with the divorce. And it was a vision of my family if I didn't go through with it. Mm. And, and it was scary. And it really helped me to see that like, sometimes staying is worse for the kids. Mm. And I was able to hold that in my mind and know that, okay, I stayed as long as I did for the sake of my kids and I'm leaving when I am for the sake of my kids. And that's what gave me the courage to do it. And every time I had someone come to me and I had a lot of people come to me and say, I think you're making a mistake. Why don't you give this another chance? Uh, don't do this to your kids. You're going to mess them up, you know, things like that. And I could just hold on to that vision and know, okay, God showed me what would happen if I stayed. And that's not what I want for my children. And so there's got to be a better future for them ahead of me. And, and it was for me, I, I had to be unshakable in my conviction because I had so much opposition to leaving, um, it, just a tremendous amount of opposition. And then, and then just the obstacles, just, just, okay. I'm a single mom with five kids and my youngest is two years old and, and my career is in shambles. And, um, you know, I'm a romance writer and, and suddenly I don't know how to write a romance novel anymore because I'm so hurt and jaded and questioning everything about love and, commitment, you know, like all those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I think that that vision was really what propelled me when, when I felt so afraid of the future. Wow. It's amazing how God gives us little gifts like that, that he gives us something that he knows will be strong enough to motivate us forward. And sometimes it's, this is what will happen if you don't. And sometimes it's, Kate, you've got to do this because, and it's a positive thing, but it's still scary, right? Right. But either way, it, it sometimes that vision, it has to be strong enough, whatever the emotion is, to propel us through the yucky middle that is so scary and frightening. Yes. And yeah. as you were talking, I was just thinking what, um, that as friends and neighbors of people going through, for example, a divorce, how important it is to be supportive because you said you got a lot of backlash that yes, as a general rule, maybe it is better, but I think that's the cool thing about involving God in any big decision like this is that you are getting inspiration specifically for you. Right. Right. Yeah. And that, and that whoever you are, if you're watching somebody go through this, let them make that decision, especially if they're making it with God that, trust that God has their back, you know, and that he's going to guide them to make the right decision for them. Does that absolutely. make sense? Yes, absolutely. There is not, 
there's no life plan that is one size fits all. Mm. And when we go around judging other people's lives and decisions based on what we think is the perfect life, you know, we're, we're always wrong. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you know, what's interesting. I always used to wish that my kids came with an instruction manual. (laughs) (laughs) Like dear Tamara, this is how you parent this child. (laughs) Yes. But I think I've come to realize that the reason God didn't give us an instruction manual for each of our kids is A, it would be way too big and way too thick. And we would never remember everything in it. Or at least I wouldn't. Um, But second, it also gives us the chance to connect to God and say, here I am in this situation. What do I do now? (laughs) Yes, right? Yeah, it keeps us, it keeps us turning to him. I mean, Mm -hmm. if we were given like a play-by-play of our life, how, how would we continue to have like a relationship with him? We would just, oh, I've got the book. Okay. Yeah, I got the book. But, but the cool thing is that he does care about these details of our lives. He cares about each of our kids. He cares about you. He cares about me. And each of our paths is going to look totally different, right? (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when I, when I got that, when I got that scripture given to me, you know, Uh I'll reveal the plans I have for you. You know, I thought the plan was going to be fix everything that's wrong in my life. And the plan was actually deliverance. Mm. And I was not expecting that to be the plan. And yet I can see so much beauty in his plan that I wouldn't have experienced if, if he was just going to reach down and, you know, fix everything for me. Mm. I, I like that. And sometimes I think God gives us one baby step at a time so that maybe along your de- on your detoured path here, he's like, I'm going to reveal to you. And, and he knows that the end goal is deliverance. He's not going to maybe tell you all of that at first. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but he's going to give you the first step. Okay, here's the first thing that you do. You yeah. know what I mean? Yes. And I used to look at that line upon line thing and I'm like, oh, for Pete's sakes, just give me the end goal already. <laughs> I <know. laughs> but I think he doesn't give it, give it to me because he doesn't want to overwhelm me. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> and uh, maybe I'd be way too scared to take step number one if I knew step number 557. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, he knows that we turn around and, and head for the hills. <laughs> I'm out. I'm not going down that path. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Well, this kind of morphs into this amazing book. And I don't know if you can see it. There it is. Come Sweet Day that Julianne wrote through this process. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, we're going to have Julianne talk to us a little bit more about her new book, Come Sweet Day, and why it is different than her books, Eden Brook and Blackmore and what it is exactly and how it can benefit both you and those who are struggling that are within your sphere of influence. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Tamara K. Anderson, and I want to share something special with you. When our son Nathan was diagnosed with autism, I felt like the life we had expected for him was ripped away, and with it, my own heart shattered as well. It's very common for families to feel anger, pain, confusion, and anxiety when a child is diagnosed. This is where my book, Normal For Me, comes into play. It shares my story of learning to replace my pain with acceptance, peace, joy, and hope. Normal For Me has helped change many lives, and I'd like to give this book to as many families as possible. We've put together something I think is really special. My friends and listeners can order copies of my book at a significantly discounted price, and we will send them to families who have just had a child diagnosed with autism or another special needs diagnosis. We will put your name inside the cover so they will know someone out there loves them and wants to help. I will also sign each copy. You can order as little as one or as many as hundreds to be shared with others. 
So go to my website, TamaraKAnderson.com, and visit the store section for more information and to place your order. You can bless the lives of many families by sending them hope, love, and peace. Check it out today at TamaraKAnderson.com and help me spread hope to the world. And we're back. I've been interviewing author Julianne Donaldson about her crazy life situation when she went from normal through to going through a divorce and the courage she had to have to be able to press forward and make it through that. And now we're transitioning to the different kind of book that Julianne has written called Come Sweet Day. Now, Julianne is known for her amazing, beautiful, proper romance books, Edenbrook. And let's see if I can get this to show up on my screen. There's one, Edenbrook and Blackmore. I have both of them. Um, but because you weren't feeling the romance, you ended up writing this beautiful book called Come Sweet Day. Let's see if I can get it. There it is. And it is a book of poetry. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I read this, that's actually when I reached out to her because I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly what my podcast is about. Um, it's called Holding On to Hope in Dark Times. And this is your journey of little poems and thoughts that you wrote while you were going through these super tough and anguishing times. And what I love about your book is it is raw and vulnerable and it talks about brokenness. It talks about turning to God and, and finding peace and solace and um, hope, hope in, in Jesus Christ. Um, I'm going to read you guys just a little snippet of the introduction because it's so amazing. Hope you'll forgive me here, Julianne. Um, She says, I have learned that nobody is immune to dark times. I have also learned to never take for granted the times when things go well. I've learned that in order to stretch me, God will allow me to walk through dark times that no amount of hard work, prayer, or faith can prevent. And then you go on to talk about feeling like the devil had grabbed hold of your ankles and was like dragging you down and what you did then. Would you mind sharing with me what you what you felt and went through at that point? Well, I'm a visual thinker. I love analogies. So I felt like, okay, here I am, you know, I'm I already suffered from depression and then and then I went through something really difficult and um, and the stretching was so painful. And I thought, I thought, you know, why everything I'm going through is so painful. And I had this idea or this image come to my mind that here's the devil. He's got me by the ankles. He's pulling with all of his might. I can go with him. And that would probably be an easier journey. Mm -hmm. a more comfortable journey at the moment, you know, Mm -hmm. but instead, or I could reach up to God and he can grasp, grab me by the hands and pull that way. And with the devil pulling down and God pulling up, you know, this is how I'm being stretched. The stretching comes from holding on to God when these really hard times come. And that's, that's where I felt the most growth in my soul. Um, you know, growth in my perspective, a change in my heart. And I, and it's painful to be stretched. I don't like it. Mm. I'd rather not do it. And yet when it comes down to it, I don't, I don't want to be dragged down. No, right? So, so, so you just hold on for dear life. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so for those of you feeling that way, just grasp on to God and hang on for dear life. God is not going to let go of you, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I loved about that introduction that you, you said there was that, um, first of all, nobody's immune to dark times. So we're all going to go through them. So if you think you're alone, you're really not. Um, don't take for granted the good times. One of the things I loved about your book is that you found joy in little things and you wrote about them, things like songbirds or sunrises or sunsets. You compared 
a lot of things to what we see in nature. And it just, it makes the, it makes the comparison so much more real. Um, tell me what looking at and taking time to pause and experience nature, how that helped you as you were going through this stretching time. So when I started going to therapy, I started to notice that every night that I was having a hard day, I saw the most beautiful sunsets. Mm. And I hate to sound um, proud <laughs> or vain, <laughs> but I started to think God is creating these sunsets for me to show me that he loves me because he knows that I love sunsets. And I would be at my kitchen sink and I would look out the window having a hard time. And there it is just framed for me. And it just happened over and over and over again. And I realized this is a way that God speaks to me. He speaks to me through sunsets. I have a friend who uh, God speaks to her through rainbows. Mm. I have another friend who God speaks to her through butterflies. And I think that God is trying to speak to us all the time. And when we start to pay attention and we, and we say, oh, oh, I saw that message. Then he'll send more messages like that. And so when I saw that sunset, oh, that's for me. That has to be for me. That's so beautiful. And I saw it just at the right time. And it's just when I needed it, that's for me. And then he continued to, to talk to me through sunsets. And, and then as I turned my attention, you know, there's, there's so many lonely days where my kids were gone and it's just me, you know, mm -hmm. and I could sit inside and feel lonely or I could walk outside and observe, you know, like, what do I learn from seeing that, that bird? What do I learn from the spider? What do I learn from the coming, the changing of seasons? And, and I found so many lessons and I found so much peace. And I really felt like, like those times when I felt alone, those were actually like the best opportunities to talk to God and to find his answers around me because he uses he uses everything he's, you know, in, in his realm to, to communicate with us. And, and, and so sometimes I claim that sometimes I claim sunsets, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You can claim sunsets. It's good. <laughs> it doesn't mean somebody else can't claim them too, but yes, I like yes, that you do. They're for other people too, <laughs> but they're also, they're also, you know, sometimes they're just for you. And, and that's, that's a mark that really helped me grow in my sense of worth, you know, feeling like God could rearrange, you know, clouds and light and, and earth and, and, and prompt me to look out my window at the right time. And he would do that for me because that's how much he loves me. And, and I think if we all felt like that, like, like God loves us enough to rearrange heaven and earth for us to show us his love, then, then, then we start to come to a sense of what well, we're really worth. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. And I love, I love that you took the time to spend those lonely hours. It could have, it would have been so easy for you to be, you know, stuck on your phone or, you know, engrossed in something else, but you took those times to sit with your loneliness in a place yeah. where you could communicate with God and where he could communicate back to you through nature. Yeah. I, I think that takes, that takes courage, you know, to not just, uh, what is the right word I'm looking for? Not just um, be distracted by, yes. by the many distractions that we have available to us nowadays, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it takes courage to be comfortable in your loneliness and turn to God. So that's and a powerful lesson. Yeah, to sit to sit with it, you know, to be present with whatever is painful at the moment. I found that was um I mean, that that's really where I grew those times when I was able to 
you know, just face the pain and face the grief and, and, and let it, let it be what mm. it was. Did you find that you had like little conversations with God as you were sitting there, maybe at your kitchen oh, okay. sink or on the back patio or wherever you were? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, 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 you know, sitting on the back patio going, wow, that's such a pretty sunset. Thank you for sending that to me. Now, what should I do about my kids or what should I, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like when you see a sign of his love, I think for me, that was also a sign that, oh yeah, that's right. I can talk to him about anything and everything. So let's get, let's dig deep, you know, let's really talk about what's needful right now. Oh, that's beautiful. I almost feel like we have to share one of your poems because I I think, okay, guys, I'm just going to do a huge plug for Julianne right here. So just bear with me because this is beautiful. I think you need to have two books on your nightstand besides the scriptures, Edenbrook to escape into for those days that there it is for those days that you need to escape because let's be honest, we all need to escape sometimes. And then come sweet day for those days when um, you need to feel understood and um, it's just beautiful. Okay. Let's pick, let's pick up. Do you have a favorite one you want to share? I have so many different favorites. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Tamara, they're all my favorites or they wouldn't be in the book. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have Julianne share one of the beautiful poems from her book, Come Sweet Day. And this is one about courage because she showed an extraordinary amount of courage as she was going through that. And I have to say that each of these poems has a beautiful image that goes along with it. It's color image. It's, it's healing, not only visually to your soul, but it's healing to the words have a healing balm to them because you feel like, oh my gosh, she totally gets me. Okay. So why don't you read that for us, Julia? Okay. I'll show you what it looks like. There you go. So there's this cool picture of a light. At the end of the day, when your bright smiles have worn off and you're just waiting for your kids to come back to you and remind you what life is all about, you can sit with a porch light on and that's courage too. Mm. I love that. Now tell me the, the story behind that. Oh, the story behind that is, you know, me sitting alone on the porch with the light on, just feeling like... I don't, I don't know what my life is when I don't have my kids Mm -hmm. and, and I don't have someone to love and I don't have, you know, someone to nurture or take care of. And so I don't know what to do, you know, to get, to get a good life back, but I'll Mm -hmm. just sit here and wait. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of my poems are out waiting. I think waiting is, um, you know, what I discovered is, you know, the wilderness aspect, you know, you're delivered mm-hmm. from captivity, but you're in the wilderness for 40 years. There's a lot <laughs> of that happens. Yes, the wilderness age. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is so true. And you're right. A lot of your poems are waiting and processing these the anger with God and having him turn it to grace and mercy and love and compassion and you do such a good job about teaching through your poems how God helps us wherever we are to take the next step towards healing whatever that looks like for each of us and it's beautiful beautiful beautifully done now um one of the the lessons that you talked about learning through this difficult time was that hope is a choice and like a muscle. Explain mm-hmm. to me what you mean by that. So <clears throat> I'm not, so I've, I've suffered from depression for 20 years and I've gone to a lot of therapy and I've taken a lot of medications and I have come to me, hope and optimism, they don't come naturally to me. I am just not a natural optimist. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in, you know, a, a, a chemical element to it. And it's really easy for me to go down roads of negativity in my thought patterns. And I found that hope, just like optimism, hope is a choice. And 
for, you know, for years, I think my hope was pretty fragile. It was pretty easy to have ups and downs. And I've learned that it's just like a muscle, like we can flex it, we can, it can grow stronger with use. And I can, um, I can, I can practice hope to the point where my hope becomes more and more buoyant. And just, just getting up every day and fixing, fixing my thoughts on hope and fixing my thoughts on the savior and how he delivers me. That's what's given me this really bright vision of my future. Um, and so in that way, I learned to overcome my natural tendency towards depression. And I would say now I'm a very hopeful, positive person, but it didn't, it didn't come without work. It really took a lot of daily flexing of that muscle to, to be a positive person. Mm. Did you mention the involving God in this and that you would hope, um, for your savior to help you through all of this, what role did he play as you began, you know, exercising just a tiny bit of hope? Okay, today I'm going to get out of bed, <laughs> even right. though I want to stay in bed. Did you, did you, did you pray your way through that and say, okay, God, I don't feel like getting out of bed today. And so I need your help. Or, or did you basically, I, I'm wondering, did, how did you do that? Because when, when you do have a chemical imbalance, it is super hard to take forward motion when you feel like you're drowning. Yes. And, and sometimes I didn't. And I should point that out that like, just because I can say now, I feel like I'm a hopeful person doesn't mean that every day consistently, I'm jumping out of bed. Mm -hmm. There are definitely days when I'm not. In fact, I had this I, I, I'll, I do want to answer your question, but I wanted to share this poem. Oh, please. We love your poem. So let's do another one. <laughs> we all have quiet times in life, times of retreat, when we lie prostrate because it is all we can do. I have lived so long in this quiet time. Life goes on around me. Days stretch into months, then years. Dreams are achieved and milestones passed by others while I lie still, forehead to the ground, and plead for my time to stand. And so I think that, I think that imagining me just jumping out of bed, being happy every day, like, like that's not what it looked like. For me, hope was, this is a really hard day. I don't feel like I'm doing anything more than lying still. Mm. <laughs> or I would imagine myself like a boulder in a stream you know, and everything mm -hmm. that was going on was washing over me. And all I could do was just curl in and just here I am, mm -hmm. you know, all I can do is just protect my spot <laughs> mm -hmm. basically, but that I had hope. I had a very strong, bright hope that there were better days coming, that there was, that there was going to be a promised land, that there was going to be deliverance from from everything, you know, even from the wilderness and, mm -hmm. and yeah, and it was a lot of prayer and it was a lot of, um, holding on to the spiritual experiences I had had in the past, the experiences that just felt really personal and strong, just holding on to those. And I think that's also why I started to see God's messages in the world around me, because when you don't have like regular visions or or it doesn't feel like God is talking to you, then you'll look other places, you know, mm -hmm. like, okay, I haven't had a vision in like two years, but I saw a beautiful sunrise and that's God too, you mm -hmm. know, or the birds came and visited today and, and I felt joy and that's God. And so it's, and, and of course, and I'm, I'm never going to downplay the significance of depression you know, of course, all along the way, I had to take care of myself. I had to stay on top of my medication. I had to do all of, use all the tools in my toolbox that mm -hmm. keeps me from sinking into depression. But I definitely found a greater buoyancy of hope when I was turning to God every day and when I was seeing him every day in my life. Mm. That's beautiful. You mentioned... Um 
the things that you do to keep you um, from sinking into depression? What are some of your tactics that you have used? Because I know that that is something that I have family members who struggle with. I myself struggle with anxiety and have kids who struggle with both depression and anxiety. Um, What are some of your go-to things that help you take care of yourself so that um, you don't sink into a low point into depression? So one of the one of the best techniques I found that helps me is I start off every morning uh, journaling. And I mean, you can call it meditating, you can call it praying, or um, just taking time to think about what, you know, what the day holds and, and just connecting with God and connecting with my true self. Um, and sometimes that takes 15 minutes and sometimes it takes an hour. It kind of just depends on what's going on with my day. Mm-hmm. But I start every day listing three things I'm grateful for and three things I'm excited about. And that's just to get my, my thoughts on a positive path instead mm-hmm. of the negative path that they are used to taking. I always start out my day with positivity and then, and then open my day with prayer and Thanksgiving. Um, and then the other thing I do is, you know, I have to be really careful about taking care of myself because, because I know that I'm vulnerable to depression. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that means taking time for the things that will, um, you know, give me like the happy chemicals that I need. So taking time to exercise, taking time to be outside, taking time to connect with someone that I love. And when I neglect those things, then it gets a lot harder to manage my depression. And so, you know, I love, I love 15 second hugs. I, you know, just grab one of my kids, 15 second hug. Sometimes it gets longer than 15 seconds and they're like, okay, mom, come on. I'm like, no, but don't you feel those little chemicals surging from your brain? This is so good. <laughs> My goodness. No, I love that. And, and I've heard that as well. And I have a friend who does do that, that every time I see her, she gives me at least a 15 second hug and they're the best hugs ever. I'm just saying. <laughs> they are. There, there is actually like, I think it's actually eight seconds is about the time when, uh, when your brain starts to release the happy chemicals. And yeah, I can actually, I'll just hold my kids and especially my teenagers who also suffer from depression and anxiety. I'll just hold on to them and count slowly. And then once I start to feel that nice little happy, ah, okay, I'm starting to relax. I'm starting to feel well-being. Uh-huh. Like this means that my brain is releasing happy chemicals. And then I say to my kids, do you feel it? Is your brain, is your brain kicking in and releasing the happy chemicals too? And they say, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. But it's, it's good to know these little tips and tricks because they really can make a difference. And, and I love that you have come to the realization that you are worth taking care of and that you have to do these things to take care of yourself. I think, especially as moms, we are super neglectful of ourselves. It's like we take care of everybody else Mm -hmm. and we're like last on the totem pole. You know, it's like, if I have time, <laughs> I know, and it can be so easy to fall into that. Yeah. And then, and, and then, but then I just, I, I'm just no good. Right. Mom, you know, like if I can't replenish myself, then I have nothing to give mm-hmm. to the people I want to serve. No, I think that's, that is such a wise wise lesson that that you have learned. This has been so amazing. And I feel like you've shared so many, not only amazing tips for getting through hard times, but tips to um, to help you move forward or maybe hold still with a little more patience um, with the process. And before we go, you've shared your favorite Bible verse with us. Would you please share with us how people can find you, get a hold of you, read your books? Um, and then would you mind at the very end reading the conclusion of your Come Sweet Day book for us? 
Oh, I'm happy to. Thank you. Okay, so if you want to get a hold of me, you can find me. Um, my website is juliannedonaldson.com. I'm on Facebook as author Julianne, and I'm on Instagram as writer Julianne. Basically, Julianne. That's, that's <laughs> my tag. Yes, and thank you so much for having me. It's been so good to talk and connect. And um, so this is the conclusion of my book, Come Sweet Day. What's so great about the unchosen life, the detours and the derailments and the catastrophes? What's so wonderful about the empty bank account, the broken heart or the sick loved one? It's the privilege of seeing the hand of the Lord in your life. I never knew how much God had prepared for me and how much he works for my benefit until I entered my wilderness, until I started my rough sea voyage. I had no idea in my self-sufficiency how much goodness and generosity live in the hearts of the people all around me. This wilderness I've been living in for the past few years has enabled me to feel more joy and greater love than I ever imagined I could. What a privilege it is to be chosen for refining. What an honor to be humbled so that I can see who has been supporting me all along. And how choice are these days when heaven's veil is parted for a moment and I glimpse angels winging their way to earth to come to my aid. Healing is a journey, becoming is a journey. Growth and change are all part of life's test. For the record, I have not arrived. I'm not on the other side of anything. I feel like I've been running a marathon for years now, yet it's only mile 13. For anyone who is just starting their race or feels like it will never end, I'm not on the other side telling you to just keep running. I'm in the pack with you, maybe even behind you. And I'm calling out, keep running, keep your head up. This will be worth it. It will all be worth it. I'm telling it to myself just as much as I'm telling it to you. Because here's the thing, you don't have to get to the other side of a trial in order to be grateful for that trial, or in order to have your faith strengthened, or in order to recognize the compensatory blessings of the Lord. In fact, if you're thinking you're going to wait until you get to the end to find those things, you'll be missing out. You've got to run the race with your happy shirt on. Run the race because you're grateful to be alive. Run the race because running it will make you stronger than you were before. Run the race because God set the race before you. God is good. Trust him. Thank you for sharing that. I know when I read that, I just thought, oh, we have got to end the podcast with this because it's just beautiful. And and it is it is such a beautiful book. So if you or someone you know is really, really struggling right now and and you want to give them a gift that is not only meaningful, but will help them feel understood and like somebody understands where they are, I recommend this book, Come Sweet Day by Julianne Donaldson. And it is just phenomenal. I've already given a copy away to a friend who's going through a divorce and it is powerful. So I highly recommend it. Julianne, thank you for writing it. Thank you for pouring out your soul into this book so that others know they're not alone. Thank you, Tamara. It's been so good to talk to you. And, and I hope that something I share can help someone else who's struggling because I know that we're not alone. You're not alone. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, subscribe so you can get your weekly dose of powerful stories of hope. I know there are many of you out there who are going through a hard time, and I hope you found useful things that you can apply to your own life in today's podcast. If you would like to access the show notes of today's show, please visit my website, storiesofhopepodcast.com. There you will find a summary of today's show, the transcript, and one of my favorite takeaways. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this episode with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a quote or a scripture verse that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this podcast. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going 
when things get tough, remember to walk with Christ and he will help you bear the burden. And above all else, remember God loves you.